Hi everyone, Nathan from Arms and Armor in the Oakshot Institute here. I want to talk to you today about maces and flails. Okay, so these are some of the most iconic medieval weapons, uh, especially in film and fantasy, and they have a complex history uh, that is different than, than many people may think or realize. So, a mace, right, is a club. It's a club with a weighted end, uh, which makes it really not much different than a shillelagh or a, a nightstick, uh, or even a cane, right? That weighted end uh, assists in uh, delivering really devastating blows. Uh, with a mace, you can either strike or thrust uh, quite effectively. Uh, it's, it's essentially fighting with a stick. Now, if we look at historical maces, uh, many of them are quite light, right? Just like most battle clubs weigh a few pounds. Right? They don't weigh much more than that because then they become too unwieldy uh, to be effective. Right? You wanna, don't want to be using this giant heavy weapon that you over swing with that you can't uh, actually hit someone with. It doesn't make any sense, except in video games, right? <laughs> but in real life, doesn't make much sense. So maces tend to weigh one to three pounds. A three pound mace is pretty heavy, quite frankly. Uh, but we see them represented in art, and in the archaeological record, and in extent pieces uh, really throughout history, uh, right up to the present day if we include them as clubs. Uh, flails are kind of maces cousins that have a striking head that's connected to the haft by a chain or a cord or a leather thong, uh, something that allows uh, the head to hang free from the shaft, which of course multiplies uh, force when you hit. Now, in Europe, the most common types of flails that were actually used as weapons uh, developed from peasant flails uh, like these. which were used uh, for threshing grain, right, for threshing corn. Uh, you could hit a big pile of wheat or barley and knock the seeds off of it. Uh, peasants who utilized these were already familiar with them, uh, would get called up in levies to fight, and they would use the weapons that they were familiar with, like agricultural flails, like agricultural forks, pitchforks, or scythes, right, or short knives, all common. Uh, weapons. Later on, we see uh, a few different types of flails developing. Some of these are uh, kind of stylized uh, agricultural flails, but with spikes on the heads, like these ones from Paulus Hector uh, Meyer's manuscript. And we see others, such as the Iberian flail or Spanish mongual, uh, like the one in this picture, that have a longer three-foot handle and then they're usually represented with three small mace heads on long chains uh, in a way that's used similar to the montante. Uh, none of these right, are really the iconic forms of maces and flails that we see represented in popular culture, right? Things like this. So this is our arms and armor uh, spiked mace. This one is based on originals from the 16th century, right? which means we're talking Renaissance here more than we're talking late medieval, right? This weapon, weighs three pounds, but the weight's way out here in this solid steel head. Uh, there are two famous examples of maces like this that are extent. Uh, this one in the Wallace collection. And this one in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Both of these are highly decorated items. 
right? These are, I'm not going to say purely decorative, but they appear to be parade items more than weapons for war, right? If you think about this period in the 16th century, this is when we're having the heyday of parade armors and parade weapons that are super decorated in Italy, uh, in particular, where we have things like the Negroli uh, brothers, as armorers who are doing all of this super fancy work. Uh, they're the weapons uh, that really a super rich guy would hold while riding down the street in Milan. Uh, it's no coincidence that maces are often used ceremonially to this day. So most universities have a ceremonial mace that's held by the president or the provost or whoever uh, when they commence important uh, meetings. So these maces are kind of a, a late and highly decorative form of a martial weapon. Now, you can use them, and this is actually super fun for smashing stuff uh, with, uh, and I encourage you certainly to get one if you want to smash stuff with it, or if you want to appreciate it as essentially a, an important late medieval or Renaissance ceremonial weapon. Uh, but it's not really a super common type of fighting weapon. You could compare this to our Gothic mace or our Iberian mace, both of which are super wieldy weapons that are definitely meant to be used, even though the Gothic mace, for example, is highly decorative and really beautiful. But this is the spiked mace, uh, steel shaft, solid steel head, this big spike on the end, it's really good for a thrust. Uh, if it came down to it, <laughs> uh, you could use it for that. Uh, I also want to show you this. This is our spiked flail. Uh, it has a similar head, but without the extended really big top spike. Um, head on this weighs a pound and a half. It's a solid steel head. Uh, this is also based on 16th century uh, examples, uh, which were probably for the same kind of use. Right? These one-handed flails with a big weight on the end appear to have been as much for show as they were uh, for actual use. And the reason is that you have all this weight out here, it's actually pretty hard to even think about using this in a martially reasonable way. Right? Perhaps in a tournament setting, right, you could use this, but if you compare this to, for example, war hammers that were for defeating plate armor during uh, this period, uh, they typically weigh less and are much more wieldy than these are, but they don't look as awesome. Right, so look at this original from the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Uh, it's actually one that there's been a great deal of controversy about that we've written in about in a previous blog. Right, so these weapons, they're historical, right? And these are historically accurate reproductions of them. You should totally play with them. You should watch the video at the end of this where I smash ice. Uh, and they're weapons that were appreciated in the late medieval period for the same reason that they're appreciated uh, today, right? which is that they look badass. So these kinds of spiked maces and, and flails are really overrepresented in Hollywood and in video games. Right? If you look at Ivanhoe or you know, the scene in uh, Braveheart where he kills the guy in the bed, uh, or any number of video games and popular representations. These things are all over the place. Uh, but really, weapons like this were quite rare, and they were probably kind of ceremonial, right, rather than super martially effective. That's not to say they don't work. Right? They do work as long as your opponent is kind of standing still. And if they're not trying to kill you at the same time, they work really well, like the block of ice that I smashed. Right. And 
these things hit super hard. It's just difficult to stay in control. Now, if we look at earlier uh, maces and flails, we don't have so much of a problem with that, right? They're lighter, they're actually made for fighting, uh, they're martial implements, or if we look at the Iberian flail that uh, Mangualda is telling you about, uh, which is from around the same time period as this, the weights on the end are way smaller, right? Those weights are like, you know, a few ounces rather than a pound and a half, which means that you can use it like you can use a Montante. Now, it's still a dangerous weapon to its wielder, quite frankly, and they were never super popular, uh, but it was a bit more practical uh, than some of the, uh, the later examples.